Hey, good morning, beloveds. It appears to be my own voice today. So, <clears throat> we are on chapter four of Science Mind Text. And I may be able to get through the whole thing because it's kind of a short one. But we'll see. We'll see. I'm, the last thing I need to do is train my voice. All right. It is chapter five, body. The first section is definition. The universe has been called the great trinity or triunity, triunity of spirit, soul, and body. The body being the result, the effect, the objectification of spirit. Soul is the immaterial, plastic, and receptive medium. It is primordial or cosmic stuff, unmanifest form. The body is the result of the spirit working through the soul or law. The entire manifestation of spirit, both visible and invisible, is the body of God. Emphasis, earnest, all in capitals. There is one body of the universe. Within this one body is included all lesser bodies. Body means the entire manifestation of spirit on all planes. Okay, he's going to quote Jesus here. In my father's house, there are many mansions, said Jesus. <clears throat> <clears throat> we do not, of course, see all of these mansions. Science has revealed to us that many exist which we do not see, and revelation has shown that the universe is infinite. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. <clears throat> the word body is used in the science of mind. No, let me try that again. The, the word body, as used in science of mind, means all objective manifestations in the invisible principle of life. The body is distinguished from the idea in that the body is seen while the idea is invisible. The physical universe is the body of God. The invisible principle is all of life. Our physical being is the body of the unseen person. Behind the objective form of the rose is the idea that projects the rose. The body is always an effect, never a cause. I highlighted that. I guess I thought it was important. Um, body expresses intelligence. It's apparent, it's apparent intelligence being lent by the consciousness which permeates it. We should not say that consciousness is in the body, but rather that the body is in consciousness. If one is unconscious, they have neither pain nor fear. Pain and fear are in conscious are in consciousness but consciousness completely envelops the body so that it appears to be intelligent perhaps the human body is an exact counterpart of an invisible body which is non-material as we now understand matter and physical form side note look into goswami the quantum doctor he talks about five bodies the physical body is involved for the purpose of allowing consciousness to function on this plane. The body is necessary to this plane since only through a physical body can we properly function here. When the body is no longer a fit instrument, the soul departs it and continues to function on another plane. Ernest doesn't exactly believe in reincarnation, but does believe that we go on. He, I think once Hazel passed on, he had no interest in coming back here without her. Back to the reading. <clears throat> to say that the body is unreal is a mistake. It is real, but is an effect, not an entity. It may yet be proven that the mind completely controls the body and that the body is but a reflection of the mind. In no way would this contradict the reality of the body, nor the experience of pain and sickness, but it might help in an understanding of these experiences. 
And science really does bear that out. That's a comment from me. Sorry. Back to the reading. <clears throat> While we may affirm that the body is not a thing of itself, we cannot say there is no body. The simplest way to think of the body is to... I just realized I'm reading chapter five. I skipped chapter four. Oh, well, <laughs> I'll do chapter four tomorrow. Um, the simplest way to think of the body is to realize that it is an object manifestation of the subjective mind and consciousness. And if we are to be well and happy, not only the body, but the mind must also must be peaceful and harmonious. Psychology has shown that the physical or subjective disturbance produces physical reactions in the body. If the body is to be permanently well, the soul or subjective life must be in poise, the mind peaceful and happy. It may be considered as a general rule that when the soul is poised in true spiritual realization, the body will be normal and ha healthy. This is the purpose of mental healing, whether it, it be approached from psychological or metaphysical angle. Psychology and metaphysics are but two ends of the same thing. So we treat the body as a legitimate effect controlled by the soul life. All right, next section. <laughs> yeah, I... I, I must have moved my bookmark, so um, I will go back and do the soul tomorrow. So that means I need to change the tab on this. Okay. <clears throat> that which changes. We have learned that the spirit is the absolute being, that it is the only thing in the universe which has self-knowingness, volition, choice, or will. The soul is the servant of the spirit and has no choice and no purpose other than to execute the purpose given it. The spirit of the universe cannot change being all. There is nothing for it to change into. The soul of the universe must obey the will of the spirit. The body of the universe cannot help changing. Emphasis earnest. This is what constitutes the eternal activity of the spirit within itself. The spirit passing into form, creation eternally going on. Since spirit must be manifest in order to be conscious, there must be a way in which it manifests and there must be a manifestation. So we have soul and body. Body, the manifestation, and soul, the way or law by which it manifests. <clears throat> Form within the formless. Our physical body is like another physical, is like other physical manifestations. The idea of body is an image derived from the fountain of all ideas. The form is a materialization from the substance of all forms. All bodies are made out of the same stuff. This one stuff is an inanimate and infinite stuff and is equally distributed in the universe, much like the modern idea of ether of space. Okay, now that's old. We don't talk about ether of space anymore. But, you know, he was writing this in 1927. Bear that in mind. And he's about to, this, is, this next sentence is in cap. So, emphasis earnest. And it is the nature of this stuff to take form. Therefore, form is entirely in the realm of effect. Form comes and goes, but it is not self-knowing. Form is within the formless. Form is not an illusion, even when it is in the form of disease. It then represents a false conclusion, but it is as real as it is supposed to be. If the formless did not take form, Spirit would never arrive at self-realization. The formless takes form in what we call time. Time is a sequence of events in a unitary wholeness. It is a recollection 
attention and atmos anticipation, past, present, and future. Simply the measure of experience. Of, of course, time is real, but never a thing in itself. If the timeless did not manifest in what we call time, it would never become, it would never come to self-fruition. Therefore, we have form and time and what we call space, which is never a thing of itself, but is the possibility of outline. If there were not a, such outline, we could walk through such other without recognition. Form is real as form, but it is not self-conscious. It is subjective to the power that created it. Forms come and go, but the power back of them is changeless. Form is temporary, but the mind is eternal. All right. So two things before I move on to the next section. One, Ernest was kind of tiptoeing around quantum physics. Uh, so, the, you know he's leaning into what will become quantum physics. And two, um, there are teachings out there that it, in Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, and um, A Course in Miracles, like to talk about uh, form as an illusion. And Ernest is like, no, it's real. It's real. It's just not a thing in and of itself. So bear that in mind when you read uh, this, okay? He firmly believed this body is real, Okay just not a thing in it of itself. Um, all right, cause and effect. Effect is that which did not make itself, but must have a power back of it, causing it to be. All manifestation, all body is effect and is subject to its cause. The creator is greater than its creation. Everything we see, touch, taste, feel, hear, or grasp with the physical senses is an effect. Things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. What we see comes from that which we do not see. If self-knowledge is in spirit and if the law which executes the volition of spirit is entirely subconscious or subjective to the will of spirit, it follows that both cause and effect are spiritual exclamation point <laughs> involved within the idea which the spirit drops into the creative medium is everything necessary to bring this idea into form spirit never thinks of methods or processes for that which the spirit involves must evolve evolve again exclamation point the, the contemplation of spirit, the self-knowingness of God, <clears throat> produces involution. Evolution is the pressing of thought into manifestation. To put all, to put it another way, all is infinite being and all is eternally becoming. Infinite being is infinite knowingness. As a result of this infinite knowingness, there is infinite becomingness or creation. The infinite knowingness produces what is called involution through the self-contemplation of spirit. As a result of this contemplation, this word of the Bible, creation is made manifestation. This is evolution. In Evolution is the process, the way, the time, and the experience that transpires as thought or intelligence or idea or contemplation, passing from the abstract being into concrete expression. Consequently, evolution is an effect of intelligence and not the cause of it. Evolution is not creating intelligence. Intelligence is promote, projecting evolution. If we do not deny the theory of evolution, we affirm it's caused to be intelligence operating as consciousness or and law. That's kind of one of the reasons why Jesse talks about a pat patterning intelligence. You know, there is something that is guiding the evolution. Um, which 
you know, Ernest can absolutely make you crazy about. All right, next section. <clears throat> Unity and multiplicity. The stuff out of which our human bodies are made is the same etheric substance from which all things are made. I don't know that we've come up with a better word, but I, we don't use the word ether anymore. Uh, we've leaned into quantum physics. The one mind conceives all things from unity, which is the one back of all things through the one law, which is the medium of all action. Multiplicity is manifested, but the many never contradict the unity of the whole. When we realize that we are dealing with an infinite intelligence and with an infinite law within the intelligence, we see that no limit should be placed upon the creative principle. Could we understand absolute causation? We should perceive it to be pure intelligence, operating through perfect law and producing effects which live and have their being, not by virtue of an isolated life, but by reason of a universal unity, which permeates all things. We should then see that the world of multiplicity is deep-rooted in a universe of unity, that nothing happens by chance, that we live under a government of law from which the vast planetary system to the Garden of Roses, from the Archangel, the Christ, to the Saint, and the sinner through the good and in which is called in in which is what in which what is called evil through the cosmic activities and in human destinies we behold the vast objective panorama of invisible but adequate subjective causes we should not separate life from living spirit from matter nor divine principle from a universal creation. God is all in all. That is, God is. And is in everything. The gardener finds a divine idea concealed in the seed, loosed into action. This idea produces a plant. The geologist finds the imprint of invisible forces in the rock. The evolutionist reads the history of cosmic activities on this planet, as they decipher the unfolding of the int an intelligent life force carrying creation forward to its consummation point here, which is the production of self-conscious life. Ernest isn't saying we are the end-all be-all. He is simply saying self-conscious life. We're not the only self-conscious life on this planet. Back to the reading. The scientist finds an energy concealed in the atom and the spiritual genius discloses an intuitive knowledge which can be accounted for only on the theory, the theory that we lie in the lap of the infinite intelligence. I believe that's Emerson. So close is the union of the creation with the creator that it is impossible to say where one begins and the other leaves off. Emerson tells us that nature is spirit reduced to its greatest thinness. And Spinoza says the mind and matter are the same thing, which Jesus proclaimed that the very words which he spoke were spirit and were life. Robert Browning writes of the spark, which we may desecrate, but never quite lose. And that he further announces that all are gods, through, though in the germ. Wordsworth sings that heaven is the native home of all humankind. And Tennyson exclaims that more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams, while Shakespeare perceives sermons in stones and good in everything. We are on the verge of disclosing a spiritual universe and will ultimately conclude that what we call the physical universe is a spontaneous emergence through the evolution of inner forces, which cannot be explained, but which must be accepted. 
How then can we doubt that the very mind which we now use is the intelligent principle from which all life draws its power to be and its intelligence to express? Furthermore, the evolution depends upon our ability to sense a unity with nature and her forces. When the knowledge of this unity comes alike to all, the tread of armies will cease and the bugle call will echo the soft notes of sibling love. I would say divine love. He actually says brotherly love, but that's just Ernest. And Ernest rarely gives credit. So right there, he just, he just quoted a whole bunch of people. He doesn't do that very often. So but he quotes them, but he doesn't give credit. So, okay, we got two sections left. Immortality. Suppose we should be able to view the world, not as we do now from one plane, but from 10 different planes. What would happen? We would certainly see 10 times as much as we do now. The present hypothesis of, of science is that ether is more solid than matter. And this means that there could be a form within the very form that one's body now occupies in space. There might be innumerable bodies within each, uh, within each, within the other, and each would be just as real as the one we now think we occupy. Again, he's kind of leaning into quantum physics here. The universe as we see it is not even a fractional part of the universe, which actually is. I have not seen, etc. Because it seems, it sees only on one plane and only in part. From the standpoint of immortality, we must have a body within a body to infinity. Within this physical body is the render, is when this physical body is rendered useless and is no longer a fit instrument through which to function, another may be already there. The physical disappearance of Jesus after his resurrection was the result of the spiritualization of his consciousness. This so quickened his mentality that his body disintegrated and his followers could not see him because he was on another plane. Planes are not places. They are states of consciousness. Is it apparent that the spirit can know nothing outside of itself, that whatever the spirit knows must be definite, a definite mental image, concept, or idea in the consciousness of spirit? Is it clear that as the self-consciousness of spirit knows within itself, it knows upon itself as law? Is it clear that the law can never say, I will not, but can only act as instructed? And is it clear that the spirit lets fall from fall the form of its thoughts into soul or subjectivity of the universe? These thoughts must manifest as things, if, as form, as body. That's a whole lot of questions from Ernest right there. All right, last section. A divine mental picture. As we look at the many millions of forms all of different shape and color, and yet no, they all come from the one stuff. Are we not compelled to accept the fact that there is a specific cause or a concrete mental image back of every idea or thing, a divine mental picture? In the subjective world, there must be a correspondent of everything in the objective world. And since the subjective world is a receptive or plastic substance, this correspondence can find its initial starting point only in real intelligence. Therefore, intelligence is the ultimate creative agency of the universe. All right. So yeah, this is currently titled wrong. I'll fix that post-production. Um, Cause you know, I moved my book bookmark and then forgot that I moved my bookmark. So uh, I do need to wrap this up because I got to go. Um, so I will do uh, chapter four tomorrow because I did chapter five today. 
we are Creative Life Spiritual Center, Creative Life Spark. I'm the Running Rev Ryan on the social medias that I am on. We encourage you to like, follow, share, subscribe, comment, do all that stuff. Um, there are two ways to keep up with us. Our website is up, creativelife.org, or email info at creativelife.org. That'll get you on the constant contact. Okay. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to have a great day, a wondrous day, a fantastic day, a magical day, an enchanted day, a wonderful day, an awesome day, an amazing day. Uh, a what were you thinking day, a we did the wrong chapter day, a it'll be all good in the end day, a good day. And if that's too much pressure, simply have a day. You are enough just as you are. You are a de- beloved expression of the divine, a brilliant light, a divine spark, spirit in motion, God in action, or as Reverend Jesse likes to call it, you are a godling. All right, beloveds. Reverend David will be on around f- uh, 5 with you. I'll be back with you around 9 a.m. 9 a.m. tomorrow with Chapter 4. <laughs> Since I skipped it today, um, take care of yourself. Know that you are loved, and I will see you next time. <laughs>